So I am Tom Fish, I'm Assistant Director in Markets at, at the CMA, um, and we'll do my best to deputise for Jenny, um, but uh, yeah, I think she, she, uh, she would have had a slight ability to speak to a slightly broader, a broader range of issues and topics and projects within the CMA. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll focus in slightly more narrowly on um, the, the work we've been doing to develop a new regime for digital markets in the UK, but also specifically the work that I've been um, involved with most recently on mobile ecosystems. So um, uh, just a, a little bit about me, which which kind of le does lead on as a segue to this um, timeline um, and context for our work. So um, I, I, earlier parts of my career for about about 10 years, I worked as an economist across various um, organizations in, in government. Um, but the, the last of those those roles was um, as an economist was was um, doing the analysis within the sec secretariat for the Furman Review, which uh, began um, towards the back end of 2018 and um, published in uh, spring 2019. Um, and from that point, uh, following that following that work, I, I moved over to the CMA and been working on uh, markets markets work ever since. Um, but the, the bulk of my my focus has been um, essentially on these various kind of projects um, which have been contributing to or advocating for the establishment of a new competition regime uh, for digital markets in the UK. So after the, the Furman re Review published its recommendations uh, to establish a new regime, um, the, there have been a number of sort of key milestones. So uh, that the CMA has been involved in, including uh, the market study that we did into online platforms and digital advertising, um, the advice from the Digital Markets Task Force to the government on um, some of the sort of more detailed elements of how that new regime should be designed and implemented. And then uh, most recently, we, we launched the market study into mobile ecosystems, which we, we published the interim report, report for in uh, December last year. Um, and then um, it, sort of most recently from the government's perspective, they um, they published uh, proposals, they consulted on proposals for legislation to bring that, that new regime into being. And um, sort of at the same time, I sort of have set up the, the new digital markets unit within the CMA on a non-statutory basis. Um, so there's, there's been a sort of over the last few years and a sort of a gradual building of, of evidence and understanding and, and sort of confidence that this new regime is coming into force. Um, and given, given where we are now, um, I think one, one of the key things that CMA is looking to do is um, as much work really as possible, as much, as much of the groundwork as possible um, to really kind of build up the evidence and understanding of as many of the key markets as possible such that when the DMU has a statutory footing, um, it can hit the ground running. Um, and that really is, is a sort of key um, key part of what we're trying to achieve with the mobile ecosystems work, um, enabling, for example, when the DMU is, is on a statutory footing um, to make decisions about sort of strategic market status and um, which remedies to sort of prioritize, um, make them as, as sort of quickly as possible. Um, the mobile ecosystem study is also um, supporting um, a lot of other work that CMA is doing, including parallel um, investigations, um, but also potentially um, uncovering information and evidence that might lead to future direct action, whether that's through um, enforcement work or a market investigation. <clears throat> uh, and then thirdly, um, the, the study is enabling the CMA to contribute uh, very proactively to Firstly, informing the general sort of public debate, but also in sort of steering and, and often sort of leading a global um, discussion and understanding and, and hopefully helping to contribute to sort of shared understanding of the problems and also um, trying to encourage and promote sort of alignment in, in how to solve them. So in terms of the, um, the, the market study and, and how we've approached it, um, in, in the CMA's work, we're always sort of um, keen to to make our 
analysis and our, our recommendations as sort of robust and evidence-based as possible. Um, so this um, this uh, is often built upon our strong um, information gathering powers, um, which we've made uh, strong use of within this market study. Um, so we've sent out, um, certainly in the first half of the study, first six, six months, we sent out the formal information requests to over to over 80 organizations, in many cases, multiple, uh, multiple requests. Um, we have commissioned uh, third party data um, on mobile pricing, for example, from IDC, and in the second half of the study on app usage uh, from a company called Sensor Tower. Uh, we have been um, gathering research and surveys and data from a large number of um, parties, but also in, in the second half of the study, we have commissioned a, a consumer survey to understand um, switching and, and sort of user decision making. And um, we've been um, meeting with and speaking with a sort of very wide, uh, diverse range of um, sort of market participants and stakeholders, um, and, and with an emphasis in the second half of the study on um, trying to uh, inform our assessment of possible interventions, but also um, within that, trying to um, really, really hone in on some quite technical issues around security. So I'll start by giving um, a bit of an overview of um, mobile ecosystems and, and our sort of uh, understanding of them. Um, and, and then after that, I'll sort of drill into um, a sort of high, high level summary of our findings in each of the sort of themes that we're looking at. So um, this, this diagram, I think, sort of serves two, two useful uh, purposes. Um, firstly, uh, I think it, it illustrates um, quite aptly the, um, the binary choice that users make when they go to purchase a smartphone or a tablet um, between Apple's and Google's um, mobile ecosystems. And whether it's a sort of knowing or conscious decision, um, it's at that point that they they sort of go go to sort of reach a fork in the road and, and make a decision about sort of various other products and services that they'll also be consuming uh, further down the supply chain. Um, the other thing this diagram sort of illustrates essentially is is the reach and scope of our study, um, and we are uh, kind of breaking our analysis of of, of all of these um, different squares into uh, four themes. So. Uh, theme one is uh, an analysis of uh, competition in the supply of devices and operating systems. Uh, theme two is looking at uh, the distribution of uh, native apps, um, which essentially means uh, app stores in in, in current current world. Um, uh, theme three is looking at competition in supply of browsers and with that browser engines. Um, and theme four is looking at um, the role that Apple and Google play um, in competition between app developers downstream, uh, which of course um, they themselves are. So one, one of the really kind of critical things that we've had to get um, a handle on within this study, um, and that cuts through um, a lot of what we, um, a lot of what we've been thinking about, um, is the fact that um, despite um, perhaps from a consumer perspective, um, Apple and Google's sort of set of uh, products and services um, appearing on the face of it quite similar. Um, so if you buy sort of an iPhone or a Samsung uh, device with Android, um, you get a pretty pretty similar set of uh, features and functionality and apps and um, services that you can access. Um, but from a sort of business model perspective, um, Apple and Google's uh, ecosystems are run very differently. Um, and this, this links to um, their, their differing incentives uh, they face. Um, so Apple, as, as everyone's aware, is, is primarily a devices business, um, uh, primarily making its money from iPhones. Google is an advertising business, uh, making the bulk of its money from uh, search advertising. Um, and this uh, leads to them having um, quite contrasting incentives in a number of areas, one being um, around the uh, incentives to sort of discourage users switching between uh, between different um, devices operating systems. Apple only makes money from Apple users, and so uh, has strong incentive to 
um, discourage people from uh, moving away to Android, whereas uh, Google really does make um, money from practically everybody. So um, it's sort of ha has has less of a worry about uh, about consumers uh, switching over to Apple devices. Um, uh, linked to that, Apple really has some sort of limited incentive to do anything that might um, enhance or improve the quality or experience of an Android device. Um, whereas Google obviously sort of um, has, has less less to worry about there. Um, and, I, and I think uh, finally one of the key key differences is around the incentives to try to steer um, the sort of access of content either through uh, sort of the environment of a controlled native app versus um, the open web. Um, Apple very much um, incentivized to um, kind of yeah, steer users to using um, native apps that they download through the App Store and Apple makes um, a tidy sum from. Whereas Google, um, although that applies to some extent, Google very much benefits from um, information being on the open web and, and ultimately searchable. Um, and and this, this, this kind of plays into slightly different approaches that they take. Thomas, can I interrupt you for a second, please? Yes, please do, yeah. We, we, uh, can you make your slides uh, your full screen? Because they, it, it appears that we are still on the first slide. Uh, so probably... Right. Or maybe if you make it full screen, it would be easier. But now it works anyway. Thank you very much. Apologies. So what? What? So the, the, I, I I was seeing it full screen. So um, apologies. So I was um I was seeing it full screen. Uh, have you caught up on the slide? I I don't really get to see what you're seeing. So um, it's it's. We now see the slide uh, with ecosystem openness with three with three columns. Apple and Google. Okay, you caught you you caught up then. So, um, have you been on on the first slide that entire time? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, apologies for that. <laughs> um, so so um, Um, did, this, did the slide just move? Yeah. Okay. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna um, thank being able to move the slides and not try and present the full screen. I'm afraid because I. I've already tried that and it seemed it wasn't working. So, um, let me. Uh, let me. Let me. Um, at least be able to move them on for you and speak to them as I go. So. Um, So um, yeah, so I, I was I was speaking about the um, the differing incentives, um, and this was the the slide the slide I was speaking to. And essentially, the, the slide um, sort of illustrates that uh, the different sources of revenue um, that Apple and Google each face, um, and how that and I was explaining how that that feeds through into having very different incentives, and and ultimately leads to um, the decisions that each firm takes in terms of the sort of slightly differing um, levels of openness with regards to their ecosystems. Um, so as a result, uh, Apple um, has iOS that is um, essentially tied to Apple devices, uh, neither being sort of available without the other, um, whereas Google uh, runs Android on an open source basis and um, allows it to be forked. Um, Apple allows uh, native apps to be uh, accessed through its app store um, and, and no other source, uh, whereas Google allows alternative app, app stores and sideloading. Um, with regards to browsers, um, all browsers on Apple devices, Apple mobile devices, I should say, are, are built on WebKit, um, whereas uh, alternatives um, to Google's uh, uh, browser engine are allowed on Android devices. And then finally, um, there are various sort of limitations to interoperability between Apple devices and uh, others, uh, whereas again, Google uh, sort of Google allows um, these devices to interoperate with others. 
Um, and then, and then it's just sort of final thing on the overview, just to say that um, whenever we're considering um, like ultimately um, the value of in intervening in any particular market, um, we bring we bring it back to an assessment of consumer welfare, um, whether an intervention could um, could lead to an increase in consumer welfare um, as a result. Um, and there are a number of um, ways in which we're assessing sort of what is ultimately at stake for consumers with regards to uh, weak competition uh, between mobile ecosystems. Um, firstly, I think most importantly, though, they're probably most difficult to uh, evidence is um, the, uh, the sort of the concern that users will be missing out on uh, valuable uh, innovation. Um, there is the uh, likely uh, outcome that weak competition leads to uh, users facing higher prices, whether that's for devices that they purchase or uh, apps that they subscribe to. Um, and there are a number of other ways in which um, sort of users can use sort of experience of their devices and the uh, services can be uh, can be affected directly. Um, one other important uh, thing to note here really with uh, regard to um, sort of user outcomes um, is uh, it's, it's sort of been been sort of raised with us uh, in a number of number of ways that sort of, uh, there are um, a range of potential trade-offs uh, for consumers uh, if uh, in terms of competition um, potentially being traded off with um, users security privacy and safety online um, and it has been put to us that um, in, in some respects in enabling comp greater competition could lead to worse outcomes in some of those areas uh, and in particular um, uh, Apple refers to these uh, issues as uh, as justifications for a number of uh, the restrictions that it imposes on competition within its ecosystem. So moving on to um, sort of theme by theme assessment, which I'll, I'll try and rattle through um, relatively quickly because there's a lot of potential material to cover. Um, so within uh, theme one, which looks at um, competition uh, in the supply of devices and operating systems. Um, relatively un unsurprising sort of finding really um, that, we, that we concluded uh, uh, in the interim report at least that uh, both Apple and Google have market power in the supply of uh, mobile operating systems and also uh, devices in, in the case of Apple. Um, and the, the kind of key reasons for that are um, Firstly, we, we concluded there's, there's sort of little constraint provided by competition between Apple and Google, largely down to a lack of switching, uh, which we, ex we explain in part by some material barriers to switching. Um, but as I said earlier, we're doing, we're conducting a survey on this to try and gain some sort of better and more relevant evidence on that. Um, I think there's also, we've also concluded that uh, there are also um, material barriers to entry for new potential rival operating system providers. And this was evidenced most clearly by uh, the experiences of Microsoft and also Amazon in the smartphone market. And um, this is down to a combination of factors, including uh, strong indirect network effects um, and economies of scale. Um, and essentially the, the sort of the need to um, obtain sort of sufficient scale of um, users, but also um, content providers through app stores. Um, and then also uh, Google has a sort of complex web of contractual and financial arrangements with uh, device manufacturers that operate Android and to the extent that it ultimately pays them to use it. So it would be, um, it would be a sort of a, tr a tricky decision for those, those device manufacturers to decide to sort of go it alone in, in those circumstances. So, I will, I will sort of um, run through the next couple of slides quite quickly. The first was just um, illustrating some of the, our analysis of uh, pricing of devices, um, which uh, I think we concluded is largely consistent with a um, uh, lack of effective competition on price, um, largely demonstrating that sort of, uh, the two 
that iOS and Android devices seem to largely be priced in sort of slightly different segments of the market. Uh, and this slide really sets out, um, visually at least, uh, the, the sort of scale and complexity of um, Google's agreements that it has in place with uh, device manufacturers. And uh, whilst I won't have uh, the time today to run, run through uh, what they all mean, um, I think the key takeaway is it, uh, whereas Apple sort of uses um, restrictions to protect its position, uh, Google uh, uses sort of these agreements and it ultimately pays device manufacturers and, and other companies to protect its position uh, both in search and also um, in with the Play Store. Um, so moving on to theme two, um, which is uh, competition in uh, native app distribution. Um, so as you might expect, um, we, we reached a provisional conclusion that uh, Apple and Google um, each have market power in native app distribution within their respective ecosystems. Um, and partly this is down to the fact that they um, face limited competitive constraint from each other, um, largely down to the fact that um, there's very limited user switching between the two ecosystems. So it, it's highly unlikely that um, either the App Store or the Play Store would feel a sort of a constraint from one another um, because they, they're sort of highly unlikely to sort of lose customers to each other. Um, the, so that was sort of our assessment of um, competition between the two ecosystems. We also looked at ways in which um, the App Store and the Play Store might um, face a competitive constraint from within uh, their ecosystems. Um, and we considered alternative app stores, side loading and web apps as a potential source of that competitive constraint. Um, the, the story was relatively simple for Apple. Um, it doesn't allow um, alternative app stores. Um, it doesn't allow side loading. And it has a number of restrictions in place for um, browsers on iOS, such that it, it, it renders web apps largely um, ineffective or inoperable. Um, so it has a complete monopoly on native app distribution. Um, and there's really sort of no credible source of competition for the app store. The um, the story on Android is much more nuanced. Um, it, uh, it does allow um, alternative app stores, for example, the, the Galaxy Store. Um, side loading is allowed um, on Android. Um, and Google provides strong support for features and functionality that, that would enable um, greater use of web apps. Um, but largely, the outcome is quite similar to uh, on, on iOS. The Play Store holds a very strong position. Um, so for alternative app stores, I think we, we put this down largely to um, indirect network effects. Um, and also, as I mentioned uh, previously, the, the agreements that Google has in place, which uh, ensure sort of appropriate prominence of, of the Play Store. Um, with side loading, um, clearly it's a, a, a sort of an approach that, that users are, are not that familiar with, but also uh, Google has in place some um, friction in, in the process that, that makes it um, quite an unpalatable option. Um, though there is uh, some, some argument that, um, that that might be appropriate and um, that we're considering. Um, and then thirdly with web apps, although Google um, undoubtedly kind of supports them in principle and, and wants them to succeed, it appears, um, we've, we've, uh, we've heard that um, essentially the restrictions that Apple imposes within its ecosystem um, are sufficient to undermine web apps in their entirety across, across all devices and uh, ecosystems um, because the, one, of the, one of the key benefits of web apps is uh, sort of the potential efficiency benefits from only having to develop them once. So um, by, by rendering them ineffective on iOS, the, the Apple undermines um, the potential for them to proliferate more widely. So moving on to uh, browsers and browser engines, um, a, a similar conclusion uh, in that um, both Apple and Google have uh, market power within their respective ecosystems, uh, Apple with Safari and, and Google with Chrome. 
Um, and uh, again, there's a sort of similar story in that Apple holds sort of a very high share, sort of quite close to 100%. Um, Google, um, not quite as high. Um, again, down to uh, within Apple's ecosystems, there, there are greater restrictions and um, within Android ecosystem, there are there is greater sort of freedom for competition. And uh, we, we sort of put their, we put their um, positions of power down to um, a couple of uh, key uh, key issues. Uh, one um, relation to um, the power of pre-installation and default settings. Uh, and the second one, uh, which relates particularly to Apple, um, is uh, the issue of um, weak um, barriers to competition in uh, browser engines. So uh, hopefully, as you can uh, see from the slide, um, even if it's a bit small, um, the, the chart shows uh, or illustrates really the, the impact that pre-installation can have on um, use of browsers. So uh, Safari is the only pre-installed app on uh, iOS and, and as a result it sort of uh, has very high high usage. Um, on Android, um, I think the, the, the most uh, revealing um, uh, part of the story is the, the use of Samsung Internet, um, which has uh, obviously high um, high uh, pre-installation um, and actually maintains uh, quite a significant share of the market, um, despite being um, pretty much sort of chrome with, with, with a sort of different skin on it and um, it being sort of almost, I think, entirely unused anywhere else. Um, so pre-installation of, of browsers is, is a really big part of the story. Um, the other big part of the story is uh, browser engines that I mentioned. So browser engines really are the, the key technology uh, that sit behind uh, browsers uh, and determine their functionality and their performance. And um, on iOS, uh, the only browser engine that is allowed um, is Apple's WebKit. Um, and so Apple essentially uh, restricts um, the ability of different browsers on, uh, on its devices to differentiate themselves. Um, it, it ultimately presents consumers with a bit of a false choice. Um, and in doing so, it also limits the, uh, the quality of um, browsers uh, on, on Apple devices, um, partly because of the way in which it, it sort of restricts and hold back various uh, feature um, feature supports, but also just in, in, in sort of a lower level of development, uh, large numbers of sort of glitches um, and bugs. And it's generally reported by web developers to be um, of, of sort of lower quality than um, the other two main browser engines. Um, and this is uh, essentially sort of feeds through into the story I mentioned already about um, web apps. Um, so theme four, um, the, the last one uh, you'd be pleased to hear, um, is uh, the role that Apple and Google play in competition between app developers. Um, so this was uh, quite a sort of uh, large, broad theme. Um, and firstly looked at uh, the different stages of app competition and identified a number of um, examples, uh, instances where Apple and Google seem to have the ability and incentive to uh, sort of self-preference their own apps. For example, um, having uh, sort of special, special access to certain features such as contactless payment technology um, or um, having uh, sort of special access to certain confidential information that, that other uh, app developers don't have, for example. Um, and I think that there are numerous examples that we've uncovered um, in this analysis that will um, feed through and be well suited to uh, codes of conduct envisaged under the new regime. We have also done um, three sort of deep dive assessments of uh, specific practices that, um, as well as influencing downstream competition, also potentially serve to entrench uh, their existing market power. Um, these are in-app payment uh, commission, and the way that those are charged. Um, Apple's 
uh, app tracking transparency framework, uh, which relates to um, uh, users' privacy uh, when using apps and uh, restrictions that Apple uh, has imposed on cloud gaming. Um, I won't have time to touch on all of those um, now, just to mention highlight one, which is uh, our work on uh, Apple's ATT framework. Um, I think not, not wanting to go into all of the details of it, because it's quite a quite sort of detailed and complex issue. I think what we're, draw what we're drawing out within this work, um, and also some of our other work, regard, for example, uh, Google's Privacy Sandbox, is that uh, data protection law really does not provide a shield for um, large digital firms uh, to um, implement sort of anti-competitive practices or to uh, provide themselves with, a, with an advantage over smaller, smaller companies. We have um, been working hard with the ICO over a number of years and have, have established and clarified that the principles of data protection law um, really apply consistently to, to all firms, regardless of uh, corporate ownership structure. Um, and, and that's really one of the principles that's feeding through into the concerns that we've been raising about Apple's ATT framework. Um, al almost there. So just um, touching on potential interventions. So we, we highlighted in our interim report essentially a number of uh, interventions in the, across each of the themes that could um, could potentially address some of the concerns we've raised. And I think rather than sort of going through them individually, um, I would just highlight that the, the sort of overarching conclusion that, that we set out relating to all of the remedies was that the, the new frame, the new regulatory framework, the new new regime as envisaged will be I guess entirely appropriate and well suited to um, each of these kind of issues and types of remedies that we we are looking at. In particular, the the potential to have the sort of ongoing oversight um, ability to test and trial particular issues, um, and, and sort of the potential to introduce uh, sort of quite large numbers of um, sort of issues into uh, ex ante forward looking uh, rules that, and principles that could address um, harm before it arises rather than sort of seeking to adopt a sort of slow, cumbersome, whack a mole approach to each of them. So the, the final, final slides for me um, was really just uh, sort of touching on um, next steps and the further work we've been doing in, in the second half of our study. Um, so, I think I, I think there's a, there's a few there. I already mentioned a few areas where we've been uh, gathering further evidence through a survey and third party data and that kind of thing. Um, but two of the two of the areas where we're really um, looking to um, build build our analysis for our remedy assessment is um, relate one relating to privacy and the other relating to security. Um, as I already mentioned, these can be perhaps used as a bit of a um, a bit of a shield against um, uh, accusations of anti-competitive practices. And um, I think one of the challenges we have um, within the CMA, but um, moving forward once the new regime is established, is um, really understand managing to sort of understand and interrogate where these uh, defences are reasonable and, and accurate and um, and sort of uh, a different approach might be needed, uh, um, alternatively, where um, maybe uh, the, the concerns are being overstated. Um, and with regards to privacy, I think our, our main um, our main approach here is as the, the work I already mentioned earlier with um, with the ICO to really understand what data protection law really does and does not require of uh, firms such as Apple and Google and Facebook and others. Um, uh, and then separately with regards to privacy, uh, with regards to security, sorry, um, we're, we're really trying to sort of get into the, the very specific uh, technical details to understand these issues, which requires uh, inevitably engaging with a whole host of experts, um, technical experts on, on um, browser hacking, for example. Um, and that's, uh, yeah, really proving to be sort of 
challenging but, but incredibly incredibly interesting um and i think that just leads me to say really that um we are yeah very much in sort of the the, the final stages of our study we're publishing our final reports um in the first half of june um so going into sort of draft drafting mode now and really finalizing finalizing our the thoughts and our findings.